Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Boggs. I'm the Dean of Physical Sciences here at UC San Diego. And um, on behalf of both the Division of Physical Sciences and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, we are really thrilled that uh, we got such a great crowd out here on Friday afternoon, pretty much the end of the quarter. Things are wrapping up and I can't think of a better way to head into our holiday break than to hear a lecture from Dr. Penrose. Um, introducing Dr. Penrose today is one of our own faculty, Professor of Physics. Um, co-director of the Clark Center, and now best-selling author, <laughs> Professor Brian Keating. So, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, one of the great highlights of my life was getting uh, Sir Roger Penrose to give me the capstone blurb on the back of my book, and that is in no doubt responsible for its success, although I've told him he gets none of the royalties. Okay, so of course I don't get that much either. But anyway, uh, today, as, as uh, Dean Boggs said, is the last day of, of final exams, which means we will have a final exam after this for basic algebra. So Roger has been kind enough. No, he, he, would, he would be, that would be devastating. I would not want to take one of Sir Roger's uh, final exams, but we're honored to have him here. He is nothing less than the mo one of the most brilliant polymaths that I've ever had the opportunity and pleasure to meet. His work influenced me and a whole generation of physicists and popular authors. His, his latest book, Faith, Fads, and Fallacies, and Fantasy in, in Physics is, uh, is really just another um, uh, epochal book in the uh, in the annals of physics writing for the for for uh, the general public, but also he can write for a physicist audience as well, and his research has delightfully taken him in a direction that is intersecting literally uh, with the research that I get to conduct. So things have come full circle. My greatest hero as an author, as a child growing up and being able to read his books. As Steve said, he is one of the most distinguished physicists in the world. I'll give you a brief history of his time uh, so far on Earth. And he has uh, many more discoveries yet to come. He is the Emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford, where he's collaborated with some of the greatest minds in 20th and 21st century physics, and hopefully 22nd century physics. <laughs> His, his contributions range everything from uh, quantum mechanics, the foundations of gravity, his uh, fundamental foundational work with Stephen Hawking, the late great Stephen Hawking, on, um, on black hole singularities, it really set the directions for many careers of my colleagues in theoretical physics and mathematics. Uh, but more than that, he is an artist, and he has the soul of an artist, I think, which he inherited from his late father, Lionel, which uh, really led to some of the most profound things I was pointing out. I gave a colloquium at Pomona College in Pomona last week, and on their physics and mathematics building, they've got a whole wall with Penrose tilings on it. And it's sort of so delightful to, to see that in, in you know, live and in person, and there will soon be a new, uh, a new exhibit featuring these, these Penrose tilings at the San Francisco Transit Terminal, which is coming in a, hopefully in a year or so, maybe less. Already. It's already there. Except they've closed it down. Right? Okay, they've closed it down, yes. <laughs> Some of the tiles were crooked. They said, why doesn't this repeat periodically? There must be a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, so today, uh, of course, Sir Roger's been here many times. We always arrange the weather to be exactly replicating that of Oxford, England, currently. Uh, so it's a little chilly, but that's the way he likes it. And it's a delight to be here in the sumptuous Tata Hall building, brand new building. And it couldn't be a more a wonderful location for him to give a discussion about a new conjecture, provocative, which generated a tremendous amount of excitement in my field of cosmology and beyond, perhaps even to those interested in communicating or receiving communications from extraterrestrial civilizations. And, uh, and certainly with regard to the cosmology that is really creating a lot of breakthroughs in modern physics today. So it's a delight and a pleasure to welcome one of my heroes and mentors back to UCSD for this delightful lecture about evidence for hawking points on the cosmic microwave background sky. Thank you. As I say, thank you very much for that overflattering introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in San Diego. And I hope my slide more or less fits on the screen there, which is uh, to do with these things that we've christened talking points. Now, 
If you know about cosmology, you probably won't know what they are because they're not in current cosmology as yet. I hope this we will see whether they are there. This is Stephen Hawking, of course, as you guessed. Um, now, first, I'm going to start this talk a bit like a talk I gave not so long ago here before, but I, I so I'll rattle through it in great speed, but still. Let me start with the universe. This is a picture of the universe, more or less. Uh, you see, it's beeping at me. What's that doing? Um, it's a space time picture, uh, but it's, I can't put all the four dimensions together, so you have to throw away two of the space dimensions. And uh, time is going up the page, so you have to think that at any moment of time, if I can say that, you have a section through this which progresses up like that. We're somewhere up here, I'm not quite sure exactly where. You might ask what all the frilly stuff is doing at the back. That is, not, I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe actually closes up spatially or keeps on going. What I want to say, it doesn't make any difference. Well, not much difference, there are technical points, but it doesn't really make much difference. Uh, the expansion here is what's due to what people call dark energy. I prefer calling it Einstein's lambda term, so I call it lambda. <coughs> I don't quite like the term dark energy because it's neither dark nor energy. So it's, uh, it's not dark because you see right through it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, well, it's, it's invisible, I suppose. And it's not really energy because energy attracts and this is pushing it apart. So, okay, so that's, that's our universe going up this way, not downwards. And, uh, well, some people might complain about this picture because I don't seem to have represented this thing called inflation. Now, inflation is something which is part of current cosmology, um, so it should be in the picture. Well, maybe it is, because it could be way down in that little point there. If it was to scale, you wouldn't see it, because it would be tucked in that little point at the bottom. There's another reason it's not here, and that is that I don't really believe it. <laughs> um, we'll come to that in a minute. But suppose it is there, then you're going to need a very powerful microscope to, to see it, you see, so I'm going to <laughs> And what you see, well, what you see is more or less this. You see it's happened already. Should I put this back again? <coughs> or it? Okay, so what you see, if inflation is there, is something very similar to what's happening already, you see. It's this sort of exponential expansion, as it's called. Um, this has a role to play in what I want to say, because if you don't believe it, you have to have something else which does the things, the good things that inflation does. Now, one of the things that people claim for inflation is that it sort of smooths out the universe. The universe might be all very irregular, but this inflation, which is supposed to stretch and stretch and stretch, and so the universe gets completely stretched out, almost completely flat. That's the idea. The only little trouble with that, that's one of the things that I never really quite believed, is, and this is where I need to use the upside down picture, so it was anticipating that I would produce this picture. <coughs> Let's suppose that instead of expanding, the universe was contracting. Now you see, if you think about solving Einstein's equations, well, Einstein's equations, in one way in time, they work just as well the other way in time. So if this is a solution of the Einstein equations, which it's supposed to be, then that also works. So you could have a collapsing universe. Now let's suppose it's a collapsing universe in which things work sort of the way they do in what we know, and you might have little irregularities in that. Those little irregularities would build up and build up and build up until, instead of having this nice thing at the end, you get a great mess. They form black holes, and these black holes would congeal and make one unbelievable mess. And and the thing about this is, make this bleep again. It's still there, isn't it? Okay, good. I'll speak out with that. Um, it doesn't really make any difference. If you put the, inf well, the thing called the inflaton field, which is supposed to be responsible for inflation, if you put that in, it doesn't make any difference to this picture. That's exactly what happens. So, since those equations also work backwards in time, why it wasn't the beginning like that? So that's going to feature strongly in what I want to say, that the beginning was not like that, it was like that. And just putting inflation in 
simply doesn't do it. You need something else. And that's the sort of thing I want to spend some time on a little bit later. But before getting to that, what I want to do is, you see, this picture has two awkwardnesses about it. One is, you can't see what's going on here, the Big Bang, so it'd be nice if you could stretch it out like a magnifying glass or something. The other thing is it keeps going on to infinity, it goes on and on and on and on, and it'd be nice, it would be nice to have a representation of that where you could see everything going up to infinity all at once. And here, it's happened again, I'm going to knock this thing over every time I change the slide. Is that going to make a difference? No, you just put it to one side. Well, so far, it, it hasn't stopped. I don't mind if this picture goes upside down, because it looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of them is a little bit nuisance. This is a picture due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, illustrating a very, very nice piece of mathematics, which ha is how you can represent a certain type of plane geometry. It's called the hyperbolic plane. Don't worry too much about that. But the point about this representation is that the infinity of that geometry is represented by a nice boundary. And you see these fish, or whatever they are, um, they are represented in such a way, it's what's called a conformal representation, so that even though the fish look as though they get smaller towards the edge, they're supposed, as far as the fish are concerned, they're the same size as the ones in the middle, but the representation squashes them. But it does it in, a, in a, an isotropic way, so there's as much squashing that way as that way. And you can see particularly that the eyes of the fish remain circles, no matter how close to the edge you get. So these fish don't know where they are, the, the geometry is completely uniform. But with this representation, you can squash down infinity in this conformal way, as I say. Isotropic is much stressing as much as that. And angles, say the angles on the wings or the fins, or whatever you call these things on the fish, uh, but the angles are exactly the same, no matter how close to the edge you are. So this is a thing to bear in mind. You can represent infinity in this conformal way, and that's a very convenient trick to use. So I'm going to use that trick, but I'm also going to use another trick, which is the opposite trick. I'm going to squash the Big Bang. I'm squashing down infinity, and I'm going to stretch the Big Bang out, both of them in this conformal way. So squashing in both directions is, is the same amount. And it so happens that you can squash infinity down, just like in the Escher picture. So it's just the infinity there. And the opposite trick is to stretch out the Big Bang. Now, I want to say a little bit more about this stretching, but just before coming to that, let me say that there are two... There's squashing down infinity and stretching out the Big Bang have a different logical status completely. And I'll say something about that. You see, Provided that you have the right, not, well, the right kind of matter in the universe, as we expect in the remote from the future, you can, the, you, this universal, this trick of squashing infinity down is, is very, very general. There's a theorem due to Helmut Friedrich, who shows that under those circumstances, no matter how much wriggling it does, you can squash it down and produce a nice boundary. However, the Big Bang is completely the opposite. It's only very, very special initial states can be stretched out to produce a completely smooth beginning. So you can imagine both tricks being done, and you can certainly do this on all the standard cosmologies, what are called the Friedman, Robertson, Walker, Lemaitre cosmologies. They're very uniform, and you can do both tricks, and that's not a problem. But you see, the logical status is very different because in the general case of going backwards into the Big Bang, you get the sort of mess which I was just showing you before. Um, if you now think of what the general Big Bang is like, uh, so here's why I rotate my, I have the picture this way around to show you what the general collapse would look like, but that also tells you what the general Big Bang would look like. And the argument is that no matter how, how much of the infraton field you put in, it doesn't. Inflation only, inflation only works if you start pretty well close to that anyway. If you have a mess like this, it doesn't do anything for you. So this is a, a key point in what I want to say, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But before doing that, let me say a bit more about these conformal maps. You see, 
In geometry, I used to use stretch and squash in different directions by the same amount. I can see the picture down here isn't the same as the one out there, but that doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, what does it mean when you've got a space-time geometry? Now, space-time geometry, you want to take it away? Okay. Well, that's, uh, it's correct that you don't see anything. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> yes. Well, let's hope that you do, you do something, see something like that. You see, okay, let me describe these pictures here. These are called light cones, and, uh, or null cones, I suppose, is the more correct terminology. But they tell you most of the structure of the space-time. You see, in general relativity, you've got a notion of a metric, and that metric tells you the scale of things in the different directions. But the key thing about it is, it tells you where the light cone is. Now this is, you have to imagine, say, that there's a flash of light here. Then that flash of light will spread out um, with the speed of light into the future. And if you could imagine that there was a flash of light coming inwards, focusing on that point, then that would trace out the both parts of the light cone, the future light cone and the past light cone. The sections through this would represent the, as time progresses, of course, I've thrown away one dimension here, but you have to imagine that the sections through it, they look like circles, but they were really spheres, and that sphere is increasing with the speed of light. And that, what, where those light curves are, is in the form of geometry. So I have a picture here of the other light curves, and they tell you a light ray would zip along. The history of that ray would be a line which is always tangent to the light curves, whereas a massive particle, its history would be, I hope I've got that in the right place, its history would always be something within the cones. So it's constrained to be within the speed of light. But you can imagine these cones, as you draw them, they're made of thin or fat or tilting over. And here we have a black hole represented in the light cones. I'll come back to this shortly. But the light cones are all tipped over to such, such a degree that a signal inside here can't get out. And it falls inwards towards this singular state in the middle of this nasty place where space and time curvatures become infinite and the densities become infinite and you have to give up on your equations. So that's what's called a singularity and that's what we expect to find inside a black hole. This is the matter in an early stage collapsing and forming this black hole. So this, this is a picture of a space-time in which you know where all the light cones are. Now you see that is, as I said, most of the geometry, it's sort of, well, at every point in space-time, you have a thing called the metric, which is determined by ten numbers. It has, the metric is a thing usually called G, G, A, B, or G, M, U, N, E, or G, J, K, or something. And that has ten numbers that characterize it. And nine of those numbers, or more accurately, the nine independent ratios of those ten numbers, um, are what tell you the conformal geometry. So what they really tell you here is where the light cone is. So the light cone is basically 9 out of 10. The remaining number is given by these surfaces here, which represent the ticks of clocks. So I'm imagining you have two identical clocks here, zipping close to each other through that point, different speeds. And these are the ticks where the clocks, if they're identical clocks, first tick, second tick, third tick, and so on. And the clock's coming in on the other side. So these surfaces tell you the scale, and that gives you the 10 components. Now it's useful to separate this out, because certain things in physics only care about the 9, they don't care about all 10. Now let me tell you something about the scaling of these surfaces here. See, one, see general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, and depends on curved space-time and so on, is now an extremely well-tested theory. And the test depends on having very, very precise clocks. Now you see, why do we have such precise clocks in nature? Well, they really come about because of the two most fundamental equations of 20th century physics. One of them, of course, is E equals mc squared, which tells you that, well, c is a constant, so it tells you that energy, that's the E, and the m is the mass. So energy and mass are equivalent, related just by the constant speed of light. <coughs> Now, the other formula is the one due to Max Planck, and that, that's a little bit earlier, in fact, 
Max Planck's formula is saying, telling you E equals H nu or HF, I'm not sure what people call frequency these days. I learned it as being nu this Greek letter, but F if you like. The energy and the frequency are equivalent. The H is, again, constant. If you take that away, that's an absolute constant. The energy and the frequency are equivalent. So if you put the two formulas together, that tells you <coughs> that mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a particle, now here's the world value of this particle, that particle naturally has a frequency which is proportional to its mass. So here we have a stable particle, suppose it's a stable particle like an electron or something like that. That electron is an extremely good plot clock because it really depends on these very, very basic equations. So that electron ticks away, has a frequency which is naturally associated with that mass. Now of course, it doesn't make a very good clock in practice because the frequency is much too high, you have to scale it down, and you have to get hold of it in a way which just having one particle wouldn't do. But nevertheless, that's why we have such good clocks, is because it's dependent on these very, very uh, fundamental formulae. So in, in, in uh, physics today, we have clocks which are so precise that you could even measure the difference in the um, if you in Einstein's theory tells us clock rates here and clock rates here would be slightly different. You can now measure things like that with a very, very small separation. So uh, it's extremely impressive what you can do with clocks. The beta rule in Paris, you wouldn't use it anymore. You would use the <coughs> definition of a meter in terms of light seconds and so on. So that's where it's defined now. Okay, so that's the part of what I want to say. The other part of what I want to say is that some things don't care about these surfaces here. They just care about the light curves. And the most obvious thing is light, photons. In fact, Maxwell's equations, the famous equation of James Clark Maxwell, where he showed how to unite electricity, magnetism, and light, that showed that light can be understood as a, a wave, which is just electric and magnetic fields propagating themselves through space. And, uh, <coughs> Those equations are completely invariant under these conformal scalings. So if you imagine, I mean, this is just a two-dimensional picture again, but if you imagine squashing in some places, as long as the squashing and stretching is the same in two directions, so here it means if the squashing in time is the same as the squashing in space, then the Maxwell equations are completely insensitive to that. And the squashing and stretching can be different here from over here, and uh, it, they're conformally invariant. So that's an example of something which is conformal and varied. But it's much broader than that. Basically, anything which doesn't involve mass, this is sort of the flip side to this, that if you don't have mass, then you don't need to know these things. The physics of no mass, if you like, is completely the physics of light curves. Now, um, in fact, most of the equations of physics, uh, the E.M. Mills equations, which govern the way uh, weak and strong forces behave, if you didn't have the mass term in there, you just look at them as classical equations, they again also completely insensitive to the scale. Now what things are sensitive to the scale? Well, as I said, mass, but the opposite end of that is gravity, because gravity, the source of gravity is Einstein's theory. Now Einstein's theory has a kind of love-hate relationship to, to uh, conformal maps. Um, and perhaps I'll come to that in a little bit in a moment. But before saying that, let me just make this point that you see some of physics, let's say the massless physics, just needs the light curves. But massive physics, if you want to do Einstein equations properly or talk about massive particles and things like that, massive physics needs to know the scalings. So massless physics is good for that. And if you put mass in, in one way or the other, then you need to know the scaling. So that's a, a key point I want to make here. Now, I mentioned that uh, in the remote future, this picture of squatching and stretching, the, the, the future boundary here is something which uh, works fine if you don't have any mass at the far end. Now, where is most of the mass in the universe? Well, where is it going to go? Well, there's a lot of mass in our galaxy. And uh, we have in our center of our galaxy a black hole, which is about 4 million times the mass of the sun. So there's quite a bit of mass. Of course, that's not nearly the total mass of the galaxy, so it's a small fraction. 
that that black hole will go on drinking stars and eating stars, whatever the right terminology is. And, uh, well, and the other thing that's going to happen is that um, black hole that we have. Um, <clears throat> well, let me see. I, I was going to talk about black holes colliding, which I'll say something about in a minute, in, in, shortly later in the talk. But um, anyway, black holes in the cluster of galaxies will start to gulp each other down, and you'll end up with one whopping black hole in the centre, and a lot of the stars will get swallowed up, and, and the, uh, a lot of other things will have difficulty escaping. So you have to bear in mind that a huge proportion of what goes on in a cluster of galaxies will eventually get swallowed up by black holes. But then you've got these white and great black holes around, and what you do with them? Well, Hawking tells you what to do with them. And here we have Hawking evaporation. You see a black hole, according to Stephen Hawking, and I, I think he's absolutely correct, that they have a temperature. So they're not exactly black, is the way he said it. They have a slight glow about them. Now, how hot are they? Well, you have to think of the um, hottest ones are the smallest ones. The small black holes are the hot ones. How hot are they? Well, they are, they, the mass is sometimes maybe a few times the mass of the sun. And how hot are they? Well, you have to think in terms of the coldest temperature ever made on the Earth. Well, it's somewhere around there. So they're not all that hot. And the bigger ones are much, much colder. So. How long are they going to be around? You see the universe expanding, expanding, expanding. As it expands, it gets colder and colder and colder and colder. And eventually it gets colder than the black holes, even the very biggest ones. And then those ones start to evaporate, they radiate away, and the, energy, the mass energy of the hole starts to shrink. The hole shrinks, it gets smaller and smaller, and eventually disappears with a pop. I'm calling it a pop because although at the end you have some nasty stuff and okay you wouldn't want it to happen in this room, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless um, it's pretty well popped from the point of view of general astrophysics. How long is that going to take? Well, for the biggest ones of all, I don't know the figure, I don't know how big they'll get. But the argument is that it's something like a Google years. What do I mean by Google? One followed by a hundred zeros, so it's ten to the hundred. And that number of years, that sort of range of years, is the sort of time you're going to have to wait before these black holes finally disappear. And uh, this was one of the things that made me worry about, well, you see, it seemed to me such a, this eternity of our universe will be um, just going on and on and on, and getting more and more boring. And OK, when you've got nothing left in black holes, that's pretty boring. But when you're sitting around waiting for these things to go off for a you know, hundred years, that's really boring. But what's really, really, really boring is the universe after that's happened. And I thought, well, I mean, it's an emotional argument, I have to admit. I began to think, well, look, I would hope the universe isn't like that, because that's really pretty dreadful. But then I thought, who's going to be bored by this universe? Not us. But the main things that are around will be photons. And photons, well, it's damn hard to bore a photon. <laughs> Partly because photons probably don't have experiences. Yes, okay. But the main point is, they don't, well, experience, if I can use that word, the passage of time. This is a factor of relativity. That from now, if that photon goes out into the universe and doesn't encounter anything else, that, universe, that photon, the measure of time, that photon, experiences, again, I shouldn't use the word because it doesn't have experiences, but the measure of time that it has is zero, right up to infinity. So the photons don't get bored at all. I mean, they just hit infinity. So this is where this picture comes in, you see. And it's partly, as I was saying, it's very general. You can have um, most sort of matter around, and the black hole will disappear because they evaporate away. And then you've got this very, very, very boring era. But you can say it's not so boring because, as far as they're concerned, you've got this final boundary. So the photons, you've got to think, you've got to think of a future for them because the boundary just run here. It's like, as far as the photons are concerned, this boundary here is just like anywhere else. And so, well, what does it just poof, or does it find something on the other side? So the argument here, and it's a, it was a useful point of view. I used to play around with these ideas a long time ago, looking at gravitational waves and 
seen how people talk about them by squashing down uh, infinity in this kind of way. And it was very useful to think that you could imagine that there was something on the other side. Now, <coughs> my colleague Paul Todd, who was a student of mine at one time, and then he's now a colleague, and now he's retired like so many students of mine, and now retired. It's rather a frightening thought to see that they're all retired. <laughs> so, anyway, um, his idea was, he had a lot of trouble trying to characterize what the geometry was like in order to, for this thing to work here. Well, I'll come to that in a minute. But his point of view was, well, yeah, actually, let me, let me talk about that in a minute. Before I come to that, let me just show where this is all going. There's nothing unconventional about what I'm saying here. I should say, this is OK. People might say, well, maybe it's a good idea, maybe not. But it's, there's nothing uh, that cosmologists would shout me down about to say this picture. What they do have trouble with, on the other hand, is what I say next. And this is to say, what is on the other side here? There is something on the other side. What was here before that? Well, what I'm saying is that there was another eon. Now, you see, what's an eon? Well, I consider that the entire history of what we think of as our universe now, this is a picture of it here, that entire history is an eon. I looked up in the dictionary to make sure that I was a little nervous because perhaps an eon was a definite number of years or something. And I was glad to see that it wasn't a definite number of years. So I'm allowed to say it's an infinite number of years, I suppose. And, but that's our eon. And the argument is that our Big Bang was the conformal continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. And our remote future will be the continuation of that will be the Big Bang of the next year. Now you see, one of the attractions about this is I don't need inflation. That's one of the big attractions. Because rather than tucking this exponential expansion, you remember my picture was to show that the remote future looked rather like that. And it does in some way, and inflation certainly tries to make it. But I'm saying it's not tucked in there. It actually was this previous eon. And it wasn't inflation caused by this um, thing called the infoton field and so on. It really was this previous eon. I should give credit to uh, Danciano, an Italian very distinguished physicist, who had an idea rather like this before I did, a certain model, which has similarities to this. It's not the same as this, but he certainly had this idea of having um, the infl inflation being for the Big Bang. So that idea was not uh, original with me, but uh, I'm making use of it here. Now, I want to try and convince you that this is not such a bad idea for the Big Bang as well. I tell you, so you need a huge constraint on the Big Bang, and this gives you a huge constraint. Let me make one point, and that is, you might say, well, the Big Bang doesn't look much like inflation, but you see, it doesn't look much like uh, the remote future. This is very cold and very undense, very rarefied. Whereas this is very dense and very hot, the, what, how different could they be? When you see, when you do the conformal thing, when you squash down distances, you increase energies and temperatures. You increase the densities and you increase the energies and temperatures. Conformally, it's completely equivalent. If you stretch it out, you get very cold and very rarefied. And so it, the, the conformal factor deals with the difference in temperature and the difference in de densities. So that physically makes a lot of sense. But to make this thing, uh, the, the case, I hope this thing doesn't keep disappearing by turning upside down. No, I don't think so, not yet, anyway. Um, the point that, that I tried to make for a long time is this having to do with the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics, I won't go into any, any detail, but I'm saying, roughly speaking, it's telling us that things get more and more random as time goes on, roughly speaking. So, that's the sort of thing you're used to, you know, things get randomized. Sure, that's the entropy. The entropy is going up. It's sort of a measure of randomness, and that's the way of thinking about it. Now, suppose I'm going to tell you the same thing in a different way. It goes up into the future, it goes down into the past. So if you go back and back and back in time, the entropy goes down and down and down and down, and so you get things more and less and less random as you go. Now, what's the best piece of evidence that the Big Bang was there at all. Well, it's this thing called the microwave background, 
coming to us. This was the thing in my title, actually. That it had the CMB. The CMB is the Cosmic Microwave Background. That was in the title. Now, this CMB, this is radiation coming to us in all directions. And one of the most striking features of this radiation is that it's, if you look at the temperature spectrum, this is the different frequencies here, and this is the different intensities. This way, you find this curve, and this curve is what's called very, very close to what's called a Planck curve. Here are these error bars, but the error bars are all magnified by a factor of 500. So if you put them the, to scale, they would be all hugging the incline of this picture. Now this is what you see in this microwave background. What it's telling you, this microwave background, is saying you're looking at where the Planck curve is a statement of maximum entropy. It's called black body radiation, and, and I won't go into that. But it means you're looking at maximum ent entropy. I always regarded this as the mammoth in the room. You're going down and down and down, the entropy is going down and down and down until you reach a state of maximum en entropy. Now that's a bit strange because you might think if going down minimum you could understand. Well, why is it a maximum state of entropy? Well, you can argue your head off of this. The argument basically is simply this. that when, I might say the universe was expanding and so something or other, but that's not the answer. I just tell you it's not the answer. It doesn't answer why it was so, so special in the early stages. Now you see, what was special about it was not what you're looking at here. What you're looking at in this microwave radi radiation is radiation and matter in equilibrium, basically. It's expanding, but apart from that, it's in equilibrium. So you're looking at maximum entropy of the light, the radiation, and the matter, which it was in, or sort of randomized together. What you're not seeing in that radiation is gravity. And the thing is, about the early state, and this always struck me as an absolutely key point, although it seemed to be ignored by a lot of cosmologists as far as I can tell, is this fact. Now you see here I have a, a cartoon of entropy increasing. Here we have a gas in a box, and you might imagine that you try to gas, trap the gas in the, into a small region in the corner here, and then you release it, and it spreads out. So uniformity is also a statement of large entropy. Entropy is going up. But suppose you have a lot of gravitating bodies in, say, a galactic scale box or something. Well, they will gravitate and they will start to clump. Eventually they produce black holes. When they produce a black hole, the entropy shoots up enormously. So entropy is going up in both pictures, but they look very different. What we see is uniformity all over the sky. That's a very strong feature of the microwave background. It's very, very uniform. Once you've corrected for the Earth's motion through it, you see something which is uniform to about one part in 100,000. So very, very slight changes in the temperature, but very small. Very uniform. So that's consistent with that picture and also with this picture. So what you're seeing is a combination of those two pictures. That's what the early universe was like. But as far as gravity is concerned, there's a very, very low entropy state. So this always struck me as a huge puzzle. You've got, in the universe we know, this huge imbalance right at the beginning, and inflation doesn't do anything to sort it out, right at the beginning, where gravity was not thermalized. It was very special. Everything else was pretty well in a maximum entropy state. And just to sort of point out the importance of this, you see, life on Earth, what's that depend on? Well, it depends on the sun. And not that we get energy from the sun, we don't, because the energy coming in go, in the daytime goes out at night. And so, otherwise, the universe, the Earth, would get hotter and hotter to a much greater degree than even global, global warming. So, um, but the difference is that the sun is hot and the dark sky is cold, and that hot means energy, high energy photons, and therefore a smaller number of them carrying the same energy and much, much, many more going out, oh, totally carrying the same energy. These are much lower frequency than these, lower energy individually than these, and therefore you need much more of them here, much more room for the entropy there. So the entropy is carried away, and, and that's what we live off. It's a point made by Schrodinger, and he got into trouble with a lot of people because they didn't understand him, but he was making basically the point I'm saying here. So the point is that you have a hot spot in a dark sky. And that's an entropy imbalance which we live off. And that's exactly it. Um, and so you can, you can sort that out by having a, a 
universe, which starts off in this very particular way, which this scheme of mind ensures that you have. And there is a little problem that you might think about here. After all, if you've got a cyclic model, and you say, well, okay, the entropy is going up and 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 up. How can it be a cyclic model if the entropy is going up all the time? And that did worry me, because I have to say it did. And I thought of all sorts of wrong things first. And then I thought of the following point, which some people will say is wrong too, that you've got to have something, whether it's this model or not, even if it's this model, you've got to have something, which is that the entropy, well, where is the entropy in our current universe? Well, most of it, people often, often used to say, well, the black body radiation the, the, the coming in is very, very high entropy. Well, it is. It's nothing compared with the entropy in black holes. The entropy in black holes today, right now, is completely, utterly dominated. I'm sorry, I said this sentence wrong. The entropy in our universe right now is completely dominated by the entropy in black holes. So it's in the black holes. Now what happens to black holes? Well, they evaporate away by Hawking evaporation. Now we run into this little bit of a problem, Hawking versus Hawking. Because the, when Stephen originally put forward the idea of this radiation and, and so on, and he argued that information is lost in black holes, and I think he was right. But later on, well, he took a different view for various reasons, I mean, I think he didn't like quantum mechanics to be going wrong at this stage. Uh, but he, I, I quite like it going wrong at that stage, because it seems to be the right place for it to go wrong. But never mind, that was a slight difference we had about this. But uh, something's got to go wrong. And the argument here is that you do lose information in black holes. Of course, you've got to make sense of that, and I won't, won't really go into this. This is more for the experts, a picture like this. You have a phase space, and as you lose information, you collapse these degrees of freedom down, and this is the evolution of a, a state, and it collapse, projects down. But the point basically is, if you lose information in black holes, which I claim is the case, and it's enormous with a huge, supermassive black hole dominating everything around, then um, the, the uh, <coughs> what was I going to say? Yes, you have to See, you lose information, so this means your definition of entropy. You have to be very careful about what it is, you see. When you start to define entropy, you have to take into consideration all the degrees of freedom which are around. But once you've lost degrees of freedom in the black hole, that means you have to renormalize your entropy. You say, do I take those into consideration? Okay, then the entropy is going up. But when you suddenly say, well, look, there's no use to me anymore, I have to redefine my entropy, and it comes walloping down. You're not violating the second law, but you are saying, well, I've, my old definition of entropy is no good anymore, I'll take a new one, and apply it to the whole universe. This is exactly what works. And so you do have a scheme, which makes sense, because every time, not actually at the crossover from one to the next, but a little bit before it, you have to say, well, well, when I say a little bit, because you've got to wait for the black holes to evaporate away, really, but... Uh, um, just a little bit before, you have to say the entropy really has got down to the value only because it's the one you now consider you want to use, that's all. It's not that there's any violation of the second law. So it's slightly subtle at this point. But I think it works. All these things need to be gone into. You also need to have some mathematics to describe the situation. I won't go into this here because I'm sure I haven't got time. But you can... Uh, uh, what you do is you see you have a this is the previous eon and the next the next eon and you've got a metric here and another metric over here. I put the metric with a circumflex on here, or oh, that was called a hatch uh, hatchback or something on that side. You see this is the light cone on this side which points downwards and on that side points out. That's the mnemonic you use. And then you have to have a metric which the bandage metric which covers both regions and you have these conformal factors which match. I'm not going to go into all this, but I say the there are equations you have to solve and all that to make it make sense. I'll make a point though. You see, you have degrees of freedom in the gravitational wave. Yes, let me, let me talk about the next picture here. You see, I used to lecture about this for a long time, being quite happy that nobody would ever disprove it. You see, so, it <laughs> so I could go on and say it's a nice universe. It's a, you won't ever know. But then I began to think, well, maybe. 
could get information. And the first thing I thought of was, well, what's the most violent thing I can imagine that could be happening in our universe? Well, the Big Bang, that's pretty violent. Forget about that for the moment. What's the next most violent thing? Well, our galaxy has this supermassive black hole, uh, 4 million times the mass of the sun. We are on a collision course for the Andromeda galaxy. I don't know where it is exactly, but somewhere over there. And we're going to whack into it in a few thousand million years. And uh, it's got a black hole in its center. I forget whether it's 20 times as big as ours or 40 times, maybe say 20, let's say. Anyway, it's a lot bigger than ours. And although they won't hit each other in this collision straight away, they'll miss probably, they'll feed each other out and eventually spiral into each other and bang. Well, when I say bang, that's the, the wrong term because it doesn't probably make a sound. It's, uh, it's a lot more violent than bang. It will be extremely violent. And the signals, this is the sort of picture I have. Here we have black holes coming together. And they, I've even imagined several of them, you see. In a cluster of galaxies, you see Andromeda is in the same cluster as we are. So within a cluster, these black holes will start whacking into each other. And ultimately, there will be one survivor, one victor, or whatever you call it, in the end, which dominates the galaxy. And it just sits there, swallowing up stars, gulping them down when it feels hungry, and so on. But before that, there will be various explosions where gravitational waves go out. They meet the crossover surface. You see the light cones still make sense. You can draw the light cones right up to the edge. And they meet this crossover surface. And then what happens on the other side? Well, you have, that's where you have to look at the equations. What you see is that the gravitational degrees of freedom get killed off by the way the conformal factor works. That's a a, a technical detail which you have to look at, then what you see is that these degrees of freedom as gravity get killed off and the information goes into the newly created dark matter. So in this scheme, dark matter has to be created at each um, um, junction between each um, eon and the next. And since it's been created, and I don't want it to build up over eon after eon, so it has to decay away. And so during the course of the eon, it decays away. Well, I think I may have talked about this sort of thing here before. This is what I'm not going to talk about here. I think there are some observational tests concerned with that decaying away of the dark matter. But let's not talk about that. What I'm talking about here are two tests. I should say CCC is the conformal cyclic cosmology model, which I've been talking about here. And these are two tests. There are several other tests you could think of. But the two now that I'm talking about here, one is these collisions between black holes, and there's, they, they go out and they form these rings that we, we see. You have to imagine on this. Yeah, This is the Big Bang surface here. This subsequent surface is what's called last scattering, or, well, there's several things which are all in the same place pretty well from this picture point of view, decoupling surface. And what you actually look back at when you see this microwave background is the second surface. And there's a little gap between this surface and this one. And the uh, dark matter um, gets disturbed by the gravitational radiation that gives it a bit of a kick. And this produces signals which would affect the speed of dark matter and so on. I don't want to go into that here because that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is this other effect. You see, here we have a supermassive black hole. Um, has it spoiled something about the picture? It has, isn't it? Yes, it's gone and done it again. Did it just do it? <laughs> it's too new fangled, isn't it? Yes. I can turn my transparency up. <laughs> the analog solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. I'll try, and, I'll try to get my fingers a bit bit. Get in the way of my fingers. Okay, so here's the other thing. This is what I'm talking about. Here is a single black hole now. And remember, it sits there, sits there, sits there, gradually decays away over you know, 10, 500 years or something. And what happens to all that radiation? Well, it's sort of compressed into a little point just down there. Remember the edge of the um, Escher picture? You can fit a lot in near this edge, you see. So you think it can be a black hole, 
goes on and on and on, and only just at the last moment in this picture does it finally dis disgorge all its energy, mostly in the form of photons. Photons come straight through. <coughs> there may be neutrinos and other things, but mostly in the form of photons, they come straight through until they hit this next surface. Now that is another test, and I want to show you the Actually, I was having discussions with Christoph Meisner, who was my Polish colleague, who, who uh, uh, a man who's been doing the analysis. First of all, looking for these ring things here, but um, the idea was they might have a little bit more of a precise test of the rings, and uh, we had an idea about um, how you might measure it. And then they started looking at these uh, figures. I'm going to show you a list of figures here. And I'm going to try and explain some of these things and why it's rather remarkable. Because, uh, well, first of all, you've got to imagine, forget about the last two columns and all these. So it's, it's these columns up to, up to here. And you will see, if you look in the right spot, some zeros. There's a zero here, and there's a zero somewhere up here. Now, it's, what's remarkable about that, you see, these are looking at rings. Now let me, I have a rather scrappy picture of rings. Here's my scrappy picture. I should have drawn it up better, but it gives you a better sort of feeling for what's going on. What they look at is rings like that, with R0 is the inner, R1 I think it's called, is the radius of the inner ring, and R2 the radius of the outer ring, and the epsilon is the diameter of the ring. So that um, is not the diameter, is the, the width of the ring. So um, R2 minus R1 is epsilon. Now, they were looking at different R1s and, and different epsilons. And in that, they were measuring the increase. Okay, so we were looking at rings with different inner radius and different epsilon widths. And what they were trying to look at was the difference between the temperature in the, the, as you go out from the inner ring to the outer ring. So positive temperature would be as if you increase the temperature going out. And that's what you would expect for the rings I was just talking to you about, the, the black hole collisions. So that was what they were sort of initially looking for. But there's something else which is what they found, when the inner one was a bigger temperature than the outer ring. And if, this is just rough pictures with the, these particularly two values of R and epsilon, that is when they found zeros. So what that means is when you looked at these rings with those particular R's and in radii and, and epsilons, you found that, what's the zero mean? Well, what they do is they look at, the problem is always, they say, you look, if you're trying to do cosmology, you've got, only got one universe, so you can't very well do experiments by making other universes, well, some people try and do that, but making other universes and comparing our universes with, with well, because we've only got no one. So what people do is a particular thing, which is not bad, and, but you have to do it this way or else nobody will look at you in, in, in cosmology. And what you basically do is you work out what's this thing called the power spectrum, and I forget whether I showed you this before. It's one of the great successes in cosmology, is that at least when you start at a I should say that you're looking at imagining a balloon, and that balloon can vibrate, oscillate in different ways. And there's one of the ways the sort of a tone it makes, if you like, which is the L value, and the different ways it can oscillate within that particular vibrational speed is the is the M value. Now you see what you do is you take this is the mag of the M of the L value here, and if you take that from the actual universe, and then you can randomize within the other part. So that's what they do. You see, to make a fake sky, you make sure that it's got the right L values, so it has this curve that we see. And, this, and they're terribly proud of this curve, quite correctly, because it does, the data fits the expectations from theory extremely well. It doesn't tell you much about inflation, or sometimes the inflation is claimed it does. It really, what it tells you is what's going on between the Big Bang or the end of inflation, if you like, if inflation was there, from the Big Bang to the surface you see, the last scattering surface or something. That's about 380,000 years. And the physics 
there is very well understood. So this is what I'm telling you. So we really know what's going on. And you get this very nice picture, which fits very well. The beginning stuff is not too good, because you don't quite so know what's happening at the beginning. That is to say, this is long angle, big angles, and this is small angles, roughly speaking. So if you're looking at the fine detail, you get this very precise picture. Bear that in mind, actually. Well, for two reasons. One is that, you see, when these people, my, my colleagues and I, well, they did all the hard work, actually, um, in working out these figures, what they do is they take a thousand of these fake skies. Those fake skies all have the known power spectrum. So you've got this picture. All the fake skies have this picture, correctly. That's the idea. But you're allowed to vary, and the further up your picture you get, you've got more parameters to vary, and those parameters, the m values as they're called, um, you can randomize them. So you first of all look, this is what Daniel Ann did, the colleague who did the analysis, the Korean, and he looked at a thousand simulations, and within that thousand simulations, how many of those exceeded what you see in the real sky? And the answer is that for these particular parameter values, none whatsoever. So that in the actual sky, you see an, an amount of increase of temperature inwards, in other words, decrease, it's what they call negative, because it's going down as you go up. So hotter in the middle and decaying out this way. And they didn't see a single one in their thousand simulations. And you see, what I'm imagining is that you have a, something with a bump like this in temperature and your ring cuts this thing sort of on the slope of the bump. And so when you see a big slope, you're sort of in the middle of the size here. Okay. So that's what they seem to see. And, well, we sent it to a physical review letters and got it rejected for various reasons. But, but um, one of the points people made is to think, well, look elsewhere, which is certainly just a amount of justification. That is to say, we did it with the, uh, we weren't quite looking for this effect originally, although it, I, I should say, when I sort of realized what they were seeing and why you had such a strong effect, it seems to me you must be looking at hawking points. That is the thing which I was just trying to describe here as the, um, uh, uh, I think I'll find that picture, here we go. All this energy, mass energy, in that black hole deposited just underneath the surface here. And then it spreads out from here to here. And the actual amount of that spread is, well, it's four degrees in the sky, which is just about the size of these rings here. And that's where you see this effect. Now, if the spread was less than that, it would have to be something which happened within this region between the uh, uh, 380,000 years, where the physics is so well understood, it's hard to see why things can go bang in the middle of that. doesn't make sense. Maybe it could have been right at the Big Bang. That's, that's where you get to figure about this like, scale. OK, that would make sense. But what about, suppose inflation is there? Well, you see, normally people would think that anything like this would be during the time of inflation when it was busy doing things. And then it would be much bigger spread. So it's basically in the inflationary picture, in the conformal picture, instead of having just this much of a stretch, it's far, far bigger. So an effect would stretch out not four degrees in the sky, it could be anything much, much huger than that. So it's hard to see how it could be inflation in an inflationary model unless it was at the very, very end. Now that's what they call the graceful exit period. How do you get rid of inflation? How do you turn it off? And it's a big challenge for inflation because you've got to do it all over the universe all at once. It's got to turn off, and here it's got to turn off in such a way that you don't that you actually produce big explosions here and here and here and here. Now I'm sure somebody will come up with an explanation with inflation, but for the moment it's not something that is expected at all. And I don't see how inflation is going to do it. Okay, but then people said, well, it's a look elsewhere effect, you were looking at that, and so the probability is not so bad. To show. So Daniel Land did a whole lot more. Rather than 1,000, one he did 10,000 simulations. Now you can subtract 1,000 from that because that's what we use to fix our attention on these particular points. Now what do you see? 
Well, you do see a couple of, if I can see it here, you see a one and a two. So it's not quite zero. But at least it tells you to how do you work out a probability. Because this means that out of 9,000 simulations, well actually I should say in a certain sense it's 18,000 because you're looking at two sets of data, one where you had a small effect here and a small effect here. So you could say you're doing a simulation for that one and a simulation for this one. That's the two different things. This one and this one. So, okay. But anyway, which, however you do the calculation, that this should be a genuine effect and not a random effect, the probability from now, this is the columns that right at the end that you're looking at, the probability of that unlikeliness that you only see it, I mean, this should be a, a, a random effect. The probability that it's a random effect is, is, is about, uh, well, the probability of the genuine effect is 99.98%. So it gives you a very strong confidence that this is a real effect. So what we're saying is there is something out there, big explosions, which took place either at the turn off of inflation, if inflation was there, or at the Big Bang itself, and these deposited a huge amount of energy. And I should say that the temperature increase as you go to the center is, a, is more than an order of magnitude greater than the temperature fluctuations you see in the sky in, in, in a normal way. So there's something really there, and uh, it needs to be explained. And it, it certainly can be explained by it being Hawking points. Maybe it's something else. Then the name will have to be changed to something else. But I can't see within the current view of cosmology, excluding the one I've just been showing you, I can't see any model which explains these observations. Thank you very much. So very much unlike typical finals here at UCSD, we're going to have questions for the instructor, followed by delicious refreshments. Actually, if you're thinking of applying to UCSD, this happens all the time. So uh, we'll pass microphones around for people that have questions. Give a couple of seconds. I'll ask a question while I'm walking around looking for volunteers, victims. Um, so the other thing to get, that's hard to get rid of in science or in cosmology are magnetic fields. Uh -huh. Say something about what a magnetic field would do in this cosmology. Oh yes, I should have shown you that picture. Is, is that your question? That's my question. Ah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's something I didn't actually get around to mentioning, but um, it's very relevant to to Brian's uh, interests because um, yes, I should have. I don't have, happen to have a picture here of where these points are, but you can actually see where they are in the sky. And I should say that the spread out that I was giving you in this, in this picture here is about up to about eight times the diameter of the moon. You see, the moon is only about half a degree, whereas you're looking at something with a spread of about four degrees. So that's eight times the diameter of the moon. So you're looking at something which you might think is fairly big, although it's, it's, it's fairly small on the, on the whole measure of the sky. Thank you. Um, now, uh, one of these points, in fact, where it came about, you see, is I thought, because um, Brad has an interest in these magnetic fields, and we talked about these things previously, um, the bicep 2, uh, well, it was some, some years ago now, I forget how many years ago it was, uh, there was a big thing about the bicep 2 seeming to see what are called B-modes. Now, let me not say what they are, but these are certain signals which were taken to be indication of primordial gravitational waves. Now, I was very worried by that, because if there were gravitational disturbances in the early universe, it would absolutely go against this theory. They shouldn't be there. But then I recall something that my colleague Paul Ted, former student Paul Todd, had said to me, he asked me whether magnetic fields could get through, and he, I guess he knew they could. So magnetic fields could come through from the previous eon into ours. So a magnetic field attached to a cluster of galaxies should come through. Now, you would see these 
at the Hawking points, because you, what you have to see is where the magnetic field of that cluster of galaxies would be concentrated very closely, maybe spread out a bit because they could have a chance to, to escape a bit. They would, they would be pretty well concentrated on, on those Hawking points, if that's what they are, the points that we seem to see. So it's a real challenge uh, for, for Brian. We have suggestions as where you ought to look and pointers, um, magnetic field telescope, whatever it is, at these points. Do you see effects of this nature? Now you see, the, the Biosyn 2 was considered to be um, maybe not trustworthy because uh, you could have dust which would create effects that would produce these B mode things. But magnetic fields would also produce B modes. And it could be that instead it's magnetic fields and not the dust. So it seemed to me that's quite a possibility because one seemed to see uh, these rings um, in, the, in just those points. So this is the point I, that, that Brian has already located, uh, or, or by some people in located, I should say. And um, well, maybe you can see magnetic fields in the other ones. That would be extremely exciting. And uh, so there's a question over here. Yeah. Earlier you, earlier you uh, spoke of the, the necessity for very special conditions at the, at yes. the origin, yes. uh, or else you would end up with a mess when you, when you extrapolate it back. Yes. And now you're saying there are some uh, odd things going on at the origin. Uh, can you connect these? Yes, sure. <clears throat> So the main, one of the main arguments, which I didn't really go into here, was a way of characterizing um, the particular, I said, low entropy in the very early universe. And I used to say, well, how do you talk about that? Well, I would say that the gravitational degrees of freedom are not excited in the early universe. And the gravitational degrees of freedom are characterized by the presence of vile curvature. That's a kind of curvature which you see, conformal curvature, that's what it is. And you could say that conformal curvature <coughs> is the gravitational field. That's one way of talking about it. And uh, if that conformal curvature is um, to be uh, very small, well, this means that it's, this far curvature should be very small. That's the way I kind of said it. But that's a kind of awkward way of saying it. But my colleague, Paul Todd, has suggested, well, you could say that the condition is that you can extend the Big Bang in a conformal picture to something before it. So whereas I was saying that the photons like to think there's something after it, when you get close to the Big Bang, temperatures get so high that all particles are in effect massless because the, the mass of the particles becomes irrelevant and the energy is all in their motions so that they might as well be massless. So that's how you make sense of it at the early universe. Now, um, they would, you, you might, these things you might say, well, if they're massless, they might like to think there was something going on before. And the idea was that if you could extend this to something before, then that does kill off the, the viral curvature. So this was Paul Todd's way of saying that the condition is in the early universe. He didn't actually quite say that there was an eon prior to the early universe, but that is a way of encapsulating his idea. So if there was a continuation like this, then it has to be the case that the gravitational field is killed off. So the actual gravitational waves hit the crossover surface and get converted into dark matter disturbances, whereas an overall gravitational field would, would be um, pretty well knocked out. So that, that's, I, I would have to go into details in order to explain how this works. It has to do with the way that the conformal transformations affect the vial curvature, and there's something rather curious, which is different in the case of gravity from the way it would affect other massless fields. But in the case of gravity, you have this fact that the uh, degrees of freedom are killed off, and that's how you get this very special initial state. So the argument here is that you get it automatically in this picture, uh, rather than having to postulate something which makes the entropy very small in the early universe. Okay, over here. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming down to San Diego to give this lecture. 
Um, so I was wondering, uh, is there supporting mathematics uh, from M theory or any other you know, proposed unified <laughs> theories in physics uh, for the conformal cyclic cosmology? I've not seen anything from that. There's no, there's no relation. Well, there are certain. There is something, and I can forget which symmetry it is now. Which is, there's one of the three symmetries you get in, in string theory, which were big and small get interchanged. And it seems to have some relation to that, because that's what you get at the crossover here. So whether there's a tie-in with that, possibly. But the trouble I have with things like strings and M's is that they require these extra dimensions, which, which um, I have a lot of trouble with. But they don't make a, make a nuisance of, of themselves in ways that would spoil the, the picture. Um, so on the other hand, there are issues to do with um, and for Christoph Meisner, my main Polish colleague, um, is also a particle physicist, and he likes playing around with some of these um, n equals eight supersymmetry models. And there is something very curious about some of these models: is that they do suppress the creation of conformal anomalies. So I was talking very glibly about conformal symmetry and all that. But you do have problem with quantum mechanics and, conform and conformal uh, transformations as you get these anomalies. And if you're going to make sense of this picture, you probably will get, make sure those anomaly, anomalies don't rear their ugly heads. And with some of these theories, you, it turns out that you don't. It looks like an amazing coincidence because there are about six different numbers and they've all got to have the right values. And lo and behold, they do. So I think it's not a unique theory, but this n equals x supergravity, I think, and n equals 6 or something does the same thing. I'm not familiar with all the details of that. And what it all means, I really don't know. <laughs> but I suspect it does have a big impact on particle physics at some stage. But at the moment, uh, I don't know anything about how that would happen here. But there are interesting questions there, I'm sure. Uh, over here, uh, Dr. Green. Uh, yeah, that's uh, terrific. Of course, when people are looking for these mysterious rings in the sky. Some of the people who are looking for them are looking for contact points between um, yes. parallel universes. So they are observationally looking for something very similar, even though your concept is entirely different. Uh, if you care to address that, but my question actually has to do with the lopping off of 150 zeros in the scaling when you move from one universe, one eon, to the next one. Uh, and that is that don't you need for there to be a dissipation, uh, well, first off, possibly proton decay, in order to eliminate uh, reference frames, because you can't conform do this conformal mapping um, if there's a witness. Yes, let me first of all offer you an apology for a question you asked me last time. Because you did actually ask me a question which I didn't dare answer at that stage. Because you suggested, I don't know if you remember this, something about, dark, about black hole decay. So I forget exactly your question. Uh, I'm amazed you remember who I am, so I. <laughs> <laughs> surprised. But I was aware of the question and I deliberately didn't answer it. Because at that stage, Christoph did not want me to say uh, about the Hawking because although there had been good evidence, we thought, we didn't, since Daniel Lamb can only do his, do his analysis at weekends, you see, he's only part-time and so on, he was afraid, Christoph was afraid, that you know, somebody with a big team of researchers here, well, they just take them about half an hour and they, they work out all these correlations <laughs> quicker than he could, you see. So I was deliberately quiet about this. But I do remember your question, and, and I remember you, and all these things. But your current question, which is, I find that's directly because I can't see any reason why I should. I think I asked three. One, one was about you know, reference, reference oh, yes, whether yes, or not yes, they're yes. reference frames. Yes, no, no. A very good question, of course, as all the questions are. Um, sure. You see, you, you, you only need a few electrons hanging around in the end to spoil the picture. Because, okay, if the mass is there, you've got clocks. And if you've got clocks, they know the time. And so it doesn't make sense to do this. So I postulated that there is what I've called mass fade out. 
Now, this is not decay of particles into, into less massive ones, because they've got nowhere to go if you use the work of open neutrinos. It's just conceivable that one of them has no mass. I believe that's still consistent with theory. But uh, most people don't think that they have all got masses. Um, so that wouldn't help. So as long as you've got anything with a mass, you're in trouble. You might agree with that. So the argument is that the mass over huge time scales begins to fade out. Now, there is, it's not such a stupid suggestion, I hope, because I'd rather need it. Um, uh, because, um, you see, one of the first things that particle physicists do when they start to classify particles is they classify them according to the Poincaré group. And they consider these things called Casimir operators. And there are two Casimir operators. One is the mass, and one is the spin. And the Casimir operators have a character that they commute with everything else, which means that they are absolutely constant. So that it's hard to make the mass fade out if you have the Poincaré group as the local symmetry. But if you have a cosmological constant, then the local group is a decision group, not the Poincaré group. And then you look at these Casimir operators, and you find that mass is not a Casimir operator. So you've got a chance that that thing could fade out. That's not an extremely strong theoretical argument, but at least there's room for it to do that. So I think that the theory would have to be there in which the mass does actually often the fade out. I thought you were going to ask me about people communicating with us from the previous evening. <laughs> that's, that's wearing my other hat for me. <laughs> yes, but you see, that's a paper that I thought here, and I did write it. <laughs> yes. We'll take a couple more questions before breaking as all good uh, theoreticians need for coffee. Absolutely marvelous talk. Um, but uh, as a non physicist, let me ask a really naive question. Um, They're always the best questions. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, you're suggesting, if I have this right, that we have to wait around for a Google of years for the next Big Bang to pop up. But, but that, that suggests then that the anthropic principle it would be rather surprised that we would have to be so close to the original Big Bang and with such an enormous stretch of time between the two. Uh, what are the chances of that? Is it possible that Big Bangs happen more often than that, even though you'd have to wait around for, for these evaporations? Well, you see, waiting around becomes not so boring, because there's, if you haven't got a mass, you don't get bored, and the waiting is fine. You just sit and wait <laughs> so, so that was the sort of argument that I was making. So uh, you have to think of it as not that many years, from the conformal perspective, is, is pretty well nothing. Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to take a view of the time becomes not really the important thing. And in these conformal maps, you, you draw the pictures, and it's just there, and then it's there. So you, you can do the mathematics, and you can talk about it. I agree that it's, I think, it's hard to get your mind around. And it's certainly hard for cosmologists to get their minds around. Because, yeah, you don't like to think of, of uh, this nice picture that we have from general relativity and uh, metric being such a fundamental thing. But once the mass has faded away, and the mass phase is something which happens asymptotically, so it's not quite zero, but, but by the time we get to the crossover, it actually becomes zero. So that's the picture. Um, I think there was more to your question, which I've forgotten, but what was the rest of it? it was about, we have a couple more. Yeah, oh, it was about the anthropic argument. And, and, and the, um, well, there was a question. You see, John Wheeler used to argue about, uh, um, he was thinking of more of the universe which, which collapsed and, and bounced and things like that. And he thought maybe the constant of nature would get shuffled up each time so each time it's different. And you have that problem here as well. It might be that in one eon the constant of nature or some value and the next one they're different. And where they're suitable for conscious beings to be around, we don't much know much about what that means. But suitable values for those constants, and that's the kind of eon that we're in. We're in the one where the constants have the right value. That would be one point of view. I'm not at all happy with that point of view. I don't know for a good reason or not. I would prefer it, but it's not such a surprise that we're here. Um, and that the constants of nature have a reason to be what they have, um, which probably is indirectly to do with us being here. But who knows? But the point I did want to make here is that there is one little bit of evidence that these numbers don't change hugely from eon to eon. 
And this has to do with when, here's where I put this button, you see, we're about here, you see, except we're on the next eon. <laughs> but people like us would be around here, if you know, it's like us. And you can then see when do black holes start to run in, into each other? Well, somewhere around here, not much earlier than that. And that means that in the rings that we see, not the things I've talked about here, not bulking points, but the actual rings, there's a maximum size they could get to, which is about 40 degrees across the sky. And that is from the very, very earliest black hole collisions that you can imagine somewhere down here. I am pointing at the right here now, because that's the one before us. Um, the, the size that these circles can get to is sort of like that in the sky. And you see some, which are pretty big, like that. So they get to something almost that big, you don't see them any bigger. Which seems to me to be an indication that at least the constants which determine when black holes start to come about haven't changed much. It doesn't tell you a very great deal, because it could be other constants change a lot, and so on. But at least there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that in the previous year, at least they weren't radically different from what they are in ours. There could be a gradual change, of course. How that really relates to their anthropic principles is what we know really. So uh, maybe the last question over here. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you again for coming here and speaking with us. I confess my mathematic background is not as advanced uh, as to be able to fully appreciate uh, the expansion and compression. Uh, but I am curious, if we were to uh, almost take, a, take a page out of the earlier days um, with uh, Planck and, uh, and Einstein, I imagine uh, uh, an indestructible demon uh, with uh, infinite powers of observation, you know, watching toward the end of the universe. Um, as uh, we were get closer and closer to the uh, uh, boundary uh, between one universe and the next. Well, what would we see? He would, of course, see these explosions uh, for occasionally as these uh, well, black holes evaporate. Uh, but eventually, we come into this like a like a Fermi gas of of, uh, of massless particles floating around. What brings it from that darkness into a uh, sudden explosion well, of light? It, yeah, I agree. It's worth thinking about. I, mean, I did imagine. Suppose somebody was built in this indestructible space capsule and so on. I Forget about that part. Um, and could that observer, you know, last until? Well, you see, with mass payout, no matter how well you construct this container, it's going to evaporate away, and all these things become effectively massless, and, and nothing is going to be able to be around to measure the scale of things. Uh, so the argument would be, you just couldn't have a being which would be have a any kind of well, you could have to have a conformally invariant being, and that conformally invariant <laughs> being would, would be quite happy to reach the boundary, and so on. But that means, I mean, it's a reasonable question, I think. I have to say it's reasonable, because I used to worry about that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe our friends in biology can help invent such a being. But in the meantime, I want to thank Sir Roger Penrose for coming back. <laughs>